Okay, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, so let's start with some administrative notes. First of all, we're at 5,600 members in the forum. So that's, that's really awesome. Um, please invite your friends, please tell your relatives, anyone who is an industry professional, uh, we'd encourage them to join. The more of us there are, the better. We appreciate everyone's attendance. Secondly, um, just want to tell everyone that though our forum is private, though I guess it's semi-private because with 5,600 people, how private can it be? Though our forum is private, these sessions are public. Um, and so please be advised that anything said, any questions asked uh, are public on this forum. And this is posted on many public uh, venues. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to just load up my presentation, bear with me, and we're going to get cracking because I know that you guys aren't here to hear about our group, you're here to learn about assignments, so let's do that. I'm going to start screen sharing in a minute, hold on, how do I do that? Uh, okay, there we go. we go let's get this going on the whole screen does everyone see my screen can someone just confirm that they see it oh, guys can someone confirm that they see it yes okay perfect okay. uh and it's the what? first screen oh guys sorry someone guys you have to mute. yeah have i saw to that too many people here everyone needs to make sure that they're muted please um, can someone just confirm for me before we begin? Oh, someone's chatting with us. Yes, they can see it and you can see it as the full screen. Okay, let's get cracking guys, the assignment. So going on in your head, oh God, really this? Yes, ignoring it does not make it go away. Will you promise to make it short and sweet? Sure, why do you keep doing these presentations? Don't you have something better to do with your time? No, that's about as honest as I can be with you guys. Um, all right. Uh, let me talk to you just quickly and contextualize. Assignments can be very complex. They can also be, well, there's no simple, but they, it, it doesn't need to be that difficult. I'm going to start from a basic broker's understanding of assignments today. And I think I'm going to do an advanced assignments course afterwards because there's quite a bit of other issues. Today, we're going to talk really about how to structure your assignment and the tax issues that you should really be looking out for. Uh, so really the stuff you need in order to properly structure an assignment agreement. Let me start with, let me start with a thing that may be a bit surprising. Um, and that is that I don't know how to use a computer and know how to go down. So give me one second. That's a weird one. Hold on. Did I just lose the presentation? Hold on. Nope. Just give me one second, guys. Sorry. Oh, that's weird. What a good, what a good beginning. Hold on. No. All right. Let me try bringing this up again. Hold on, please. I I assume that once again everyone can see this. Is that right? I'm just having some trouble flipping. I'm sorry, one second, please. There we go. Okay, everyone can, everyone can see this. Can someone just type yes if you can see it? I just wanna be sure before I start rolling in here. Just someone type yes, if yes. Okay, yeah, great. Um, all right, so the first thing to mention is that assignments are permitted unless denied. Now this is kind of contrary and, and I'm gonna knock something out of your head. Most people who do assignments do new build assignments. And new build assignments are a particular breed. And specifically what new build assignments are, are they are a contract that says you are not permitted. It says in every single new build contract, you are not permitted to assign this deal without consent. And it is for that reason that we need to get builder consent to assign. Uh, Sorry guys, I need people muted. I'm sorry, I've been muting like mad here. Please mute. Um, so it's for that reason that we have to get builder permission to assign. But if you think about it on a resale agreement, there's no such restriction, right? There's nothing in the resale agreement in the OREA form 100 or the OREA form 101 or on the, any other forms that we use that says we cannot actually sell this agreement. And accordingly, if there is nothing written in the agreement, in a resale agreement, then it is assignable. 
This is important because a lot of people like to take Schedule A's of resale agreements. I'm not talking about new builds yet. And add a clause that says, this agreement is assignable to X party. And what they don't realize that they're doing is they're making the agreement actually more restrictive. Because what they're saying is, this agreement effectively can only be assigned to this party. Whereas if they had written nothing in Schedule A, it's just generally assignable. Why? Because all contracts are assignable. If I buy a contract to purchase a property, what I am purchasing, what I'm saying is, hey, at this date, I will pay this amount of cash for title to this property. That's what I'm saying. And I can sell that right. If property values go up, I can sell that to someone else. And I can do that under the normal OREA agreement without restriction and without permission of the original seller. This is different, of course, than new builds. And again, the reason it's different is not because the law is different, but just because the new build contract itself says you are not permitted to do this. So you are contractually bound to secure the seller, the original sellers, the builders, permission. And that is a distinction that matters because everyone, every agent who is approaching this gets mixed up and thinks assignments are denied as of right at law. They are not. All contracts are assignable unless denied. So let's put that aside because I know that's not why you're here. You're here to learn how to actually do out the assignment, probably on a new build because that's where the vast majority of these assignments are taking place. So most of you are familiar with the assignment form, but if you aren't, there are two forms that the OREA uses. They use OREA form 150 for condos and they use OREA form 145 for freehold. It's actually not that common to experience an OREA form 145 just because the vast majority of flips of assignments are done in the condo space. That's just because there's more product out there that are in condos and you know, therefore we see the form 150 as the most common form. That is the form I'm going to use. And those agents who are really approaching this for the first time usually come at this and say, hmm, this form looks familiar to me, but at the same time it's intimidating because there's some things that I don't see here. And the biggest thing you won't see, you might not notice it at first, but you'll know assignee, assignor. You'll get mixed up all the time and eventually you'll put down a sticky note on your, on your computer that says assignor is seller and assignee is buyer because every person who's starting to deal with assignments always gets mixed up with that. And then a lot of people just put a clause into Schedule A that says assignee shall mean buyer and assignor shall mean seller. And then they just use buyer and seller terms throughout. You know, there, that, that, that is a common mistake, but that's not hard to conceptually understand. That's just vocabulary. What is hard to conceptually understand is that when you look at this assignment agreement, there is no closing date. And that is one of the fundamental pieces that you are generally negotiating when you are doing dealing with new builds all the time. That's just what you do. You say, okay, what's our closing date? What's our price? And so on and so forth. And indeed, it's not that hard to actually figure out how to negotiate the price when you're doing this for the first time, but it is rather difficult to figure out how to do the closing date. And so, I'm going to take you through this and I'm going to show you how these agreements are structured. I'm first going to talk about the math and how we structure these agreements from a mathematical perspective. Then I'm going to talk about how we deal with the closing date and then I'm going to deal with tax issues. So let's start with the math. When, first of all, the first thing to note is when you are doing out an assignment agreement, work with either a broker that knows what they are doing or a salesperson who knows what they are doing or more appropriately, because these are difficult things, please bring it to a lawyer for pre-review. Almost everyone I know who's in the assignment space throws me assignment deals or not just me, a lot of good lawyers on this forum, throws assignment deals to us and says, please pre-review this before we sign it. 
Why? Because there are tax implications and these are difficult agreements. And a lawyer that does this routinely can see them in one second, the same way you can see those errors in the form 100 or 101. A lawyer who regularly deals with assignments can see this in a second and we can help people through. So what does someone do when they present me with an OREA agreement? Well, first off, I would tell you almost every single, we're just a forum of agents here, so we'll keep it between us, but almost every agent who presents an assignment agreement has errors in it. And the first errors, the most consequential errors, are generally in Schedule B, and therefore that's where I start my discussion. Schedule B is the math of the agreement. And as you'll see, there are four, six lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, sorry, guys, who's on? There you go. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the way this works is that we put into line one the actual assignment price, the price that the assignee is paying the assignor with the profits and everything else built in. So in this instance, I have given you a scenario where the original purchase price with the builder was $470,000. But the amount that the assignee, the new buyer, is paying the new seller is $600,000. So that $600,000 is now included in line one. See where it says total purchase price, including the original agreement of purchase and sale. So that is where the $600,000 go. Of course, the second line is usually easily understood by agents, no problem. The original purchase price, okay, I know that that's $470,000. Let me pause. The original purchase price includes all upgrades, parking, locker, any of the decor centers, whatever it is. The true purchase price is the full amount payable under the agreement, not the amount simply written at the top of the agreement, which may not include the optional upgrades or extras that a builder sometimes throws in. So we're going to assume for the purposes of our example that that amount is $470,000 here. The third line of this agreement is the deposits paid by the assignor, by the new seller, to the original seller, to the builder. How much in deposits have been paid to date? And in this example, I'm gonna say that they have paid $80,000 to the builder to date. Okay, fine. Now, it's critical to understand, for to understand line four, how the deposits that have been paid to the builder transact. Because those people who approach assignments for the first time are lacking in a very simple piece of information that will be informative to how an assignment needs to be constructed. Specifically, that upon granting permission to assign, a builder does not then take the $80,000 that they have from the original seller, give it back by a check to the original seller, and then the new buyer, the assignee, then has to give another $80,000 to the builder. That is not what happens. What actually happens is the builder keeps the $80,000 and simply credits it to the new assignee. So if you think about it, the moment the builder says, yes, we agree, the assignee suddenly has a credit of $80,000 that was paid for by the original buyer, by the assignor. And accordingly, it's important that at this point, we return the $80,000 to the assignor, to the seller, because the assignee, the buyer, will in fact be credited with that by the builder on final closing. And so what is the payment of the, by the assignee to the assignor? Well, what it is, is it is the profit, so 600 minus 470, $130,000, plus the deposits that need to be returned to them now because they will be credited to the assignee, to the new buyer on closing with the builder. And as a result, the total amount that is payable by the assignor to the assignee for this agreement is $210,000. Of course, like every standard OREA agreement, 
there is in fact a deposit right here. See, deposit. And you're familiar with what a deposit is. It goes to the brokerage and trust and any amount that has been paid, in this case, I'm saying $40,000 has been paid. I just picked a random number. It goes into line five. And accordingly, the balance of payment for the assignment agreement is thus $210,000 minus the $40,000, one seventy. And as a result, the math of this works out to be line one minus line two plus line three equals line four. Line four minus line five equals line six. And you can see that I've outlined that here in the red and the gray. Does that make sense? Uh, there's a lot more to talk about on this page. I'm just talking about the math because there are so many damn errors that hit my office every single day with agents that are struggling with this. Does everyone understand how the math of Schedule B and more importantly, the lines of Schedule B are designed such that you can now properly at least get a draft going? Does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions? Okay, we have a lot of people here. So if there's no questions, that's great. All right. So this is all well and good, but what we are missing at the present time is what, so we now know how much is being paid. How much is being paid? Well, $210,000 is being paid. When is it being paid? Well, we know the $40,000. We know how that's paid. That's paid by way of a deposit within 48 hours. Standard stuff, I think it's here. The deposit is paid by negotiable checks to the deposit holder uh, within 24 hours. Okay, it's written. So we know that the $40,000 the, the $40, is paid right then. But how is this $170,000 paid? That is the question that stumps people next. And the answer is not complex because what you will see is that there are effectively three sections. Well, actually, I'm not even going to go into that. The first thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to stick on Schedule B. And I'm going to point out that there is this line here. See this line? This line here is often not understood. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to select one of the bottom three items and write it in on this line. And what most people pick is the first one upon acceptance of this assignment agreement and receipt of consent to assign from the seller. Now, what does that mean? Well, that line is read conjunctively with section three of schedule B. So let's read it together. The deposits paid to the seller under the original purchase of agreement of sale as indicated in Schedule C to be paid to the assignor, assignee by the, excuse me, by the assignee to the assignor as follows upon acceptance of this assignment agreement and receipt of consent to assign from the seller if applicable. So what we're saying, if you select that line and most assignment agreements select that line is that Upon receiving builder acceptance, and we're going to talk about that because after this agreement is done, what, you're, what you need to understand is that it's going to be submitted to the builder and the builder is going to give it its check of approval. We'll talk about that in a minute. Once they do, at that point, line number three's item is payable, the $80,000. Why is that payable? Well, it actually makes sense that it would be payable because the very second that the builder says, I agree to this assignment, who owns the previous $80,000 that was paid? Well, the assignee does, the new buyer. They are credited with that amount. It's gonna be credited on final closing, but they now fully own the contract. And so they have a credit for $80,000 sitting with the builder. Similarly, if the builder were to go bust, they would be the people who would be allowed to claim under tarry on they would be the ones who would be allowed to claim their deposit insurance under Tarion. In other words, the full $80,000 that has been paid is now entirely in their benefit. And so it does make sense that as the original seller, sorry, the assignor who originally had to pay that money, they should get that back at this point because they have none of the benefits of that. Whereas the assignee, the moment the builder has signed off, has full benefits and rights to that money. So most people say, okay, you know that $80,000 where you have to come up with that profit? 
we will take that $80,000 and transfer it back to you the moment the builder has signed off. So now what has been paid? Well, they've paid $40,000 within 24 hours. They've paid $80,000 at upon acceptance of this assignment agreement. Now, that doesn't need to be the case. You'll note there are three options. You're able to pay that on final closing, but that's not a very good metric. That's not a good idea because what you've done is you've withheld $80,000. You have the assignor who has gone ahead and said, well, here we go. I've paid the money, but I haven't gotten it back. And now it's being credited to the assignee. It's kind of, it, it's, not, it's not clean. Sometimes it's necessary. But generally, I'd say about 95% of assignment cases has, once we talk this through and once people understand what's going on, have the deposits that have been paid by the assignor to the seller under the original APS returned to the assignor at the time that the builder gives approval. Let me stop for a minute. Does that make sense so far? Yes? Okay. But that's not all right? We still have a remaining balance. Because remember, the total amount that needs to be paid is $210,000. And at the present time, under these, this math that I'm making up, what has been paid is $120,000. $80,000 plus the 40000 So when does the additional $90,000 get paid? Well, if you write nothing, and Lord help you if you write nothing, but let's just assume you write nothing in the assignment agreement. Well, if you write nothing in the assignment agreement, you'll note that in Schedule A, it says the balance of payment under this assignment agreement. It says it right there, and I'll point out to you where it says it, and then we'll read it together. Right here, this stuff. Oops, excuse me. This stuff right here. Well, no, no, I'm having computer issues again. Sorry, one second, guys. I'm using an unfamiliar computer. I apologize. Okay, hopefully we're good again. So it says it right here. You see this? Balance of payment under this assignment agreement. And what does it say there? Well, what it says is, the assignee will deliver the balance of payment for this assignment agreement as more particularly set out in item six on schedule B, so the full value, subject to adjustments with funds drawn on a lawyer's trust account in the form of a bank draft, certified check, or wire transfer using the large value system to the assignor prior to completing the transaction in the agreement of purchase and sale attached to year two as Schedule C. So you probably understand money. I, you guys are you okay? I'm quite certain you do. What are you doing? Sorry, someone is on. Let me mute. So you guys probably understand money. You guys are realtors and I assume you do. And what you understand about money is that people like to maintain it as long as possible. And what this is saying is that the assignee, the buyer can pay the assign or the seller any time until final closing. And if final closing is in a year's time, the assignee would be foolish to pay that money in advance of final closing. And so if there's nothing else written in the agreement, then the $90,000 that remain will be paid on final closing. That is the way this is structured. So you pay your deposit within 24 hours, assuming you pick the requisite line in Schedule B, you are paying your deposit, sorry, your the original deposits back to the assignor um, on consent, and then you're paying the remaining profit to the assignor on final closing. That's the way the agreement, absent any other thing in the agreement of purchase and sale, is written and understood and transacted. So let me stop for a minute because that is really a critical component of understanding so much about what confuses so many people here. Does anybody have any questions about that? Just the basics. I'm not talking about the way people amend this. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm talking about just the way this is structured and the way to understand this agreement. Does that make sense? We have like almost 60 people here. So someone's, someone's got to tell me that it makes sense. Well, no one's saying it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to assume it does. So again, just to reiterate, 
In the normal course of things, deposit for the assignment agreement is paid at the time of acceptance. Deposits paid to the builder by the assigner are returned to the assigner upon receipt of consent to assign, assuming you pick that requisite line, which most people do. And the profits are payable to the assigner on final closing with the builder. These should answer the vast majority of your questions. Now, it is the case that not everyone wants to wait. It is the case that some people do not want the profits paid at final closing. And any of those clauses are changeable. And in fact, in certain cultural communities, it would be abhorrent to arrange for an assignment that isn't all cash upon consent of the builder, which has risk, by the way, it does have risk. I'm not gonna talk about what that risk is. I'm just gonna say, suffice it to say, if you're dealing in say Markham, it's almost unheard of to deal with an assignment that isn't all cash on consent. I rarely see it. Whereas if you're dealing in Mississauga, cash on final closing is routine. Um, it really depends on the cultural pro proclivities of the area that you're dealing with. Um, it also depends on the financial abilities of the assignor and the assignee and the price that's being, anyways, you're able to negotiate all of this. But this here is like a clause that could be inserted into Schedule A. The parties agree that upon acceptance of this agreement by the builder, the payment of the balance of purchase price set out in item six, Schedule B of this agreement, shall be immediately due and owing to the assigner's lawyer. And that shall be immediately releasable. And this is your authority for so doing. So you can have a clause like that in there. I don't suggest you do, unless it's subject to negotiation. I suggest you just keep with the standard system. There are reasons why this is a bit risky for the assignee particularly because there is deposit insurance, but if say, for instance, the builder goes bust, um, the actual amount that is excess to deposit, the profit that is being transferred over uh, will in fact not be secure. And there's a whole range of talks that we can have with clients about it. But my point here is not to get into that. That's probably more advanced assignments. My, yes, these slides will be available after Jenny. My point here is to mention that the assignment itself and the payment of the monies can be determined by the parties at their discretion. And it's really critical that, speaking of that, that a good assignment agreement dictate in Schedule A exactly how the monies are paid. Because though it may be incredibly clear based on what I've just gone through, that this is how monies are paid, it is way better to have a clause in Schedule A that says, for greater certainty, the monies of this transaction being $210,000 are to be paid as follows. One, within 24 hours, $40,000. Upon acceptance, $80,000. On final closing with the builder, $90,000, right? And in putting that down, it's very clear that that is what everyone assumed because Outside of every person watching this video and really internalizing it, it's very difficult to understand this unless you have it in a singular paragraph, particularly given that you are not only dealing with agents who may be unfamiliar or have screwed up assignment agreements, you have to explain this to the assignor and the assignee. And so having a single clause that dictates exactly when the payments are there and how they're made is really a critical component for conceptual understanding of the parties and to make sure that there is no concern when you get to the lawyer's office thereafter. I hope that makes sense. Okay, we're at 10.30. Um, I am going to turn my attention now to a more complex area, the taxation of assignments. And again, I'm not trying to do advanced stuff here. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying very hard to ensure that we have a um, we have a, a basic understanding that will allow agents to actually construct their agreements. But before I do, I just want to make sure. Sorry, hold on. I want to make sure that yeah, okay, I am recording. Perfect. Okay. So let's now talk about tax because people are constantly not understanding the taxation of assignments. And to be fair, it's fairly difficult stuff. So let's talk about it. And to understand it, before I go into the taxation of assignments generally, I need to first talk about something which I've talked about before on the station, but it's a good refresher. And that is how the HST rebate works and how HST works as part of an agreement of purchase and sale. 
As all of you are aware, when you have an agreement of purchase and sale for a new build construction, they are sold with HST. And as a result, most people assume, okay, if it's sold with HST, this is very simple for me to understand. If you are telling me that the purchase price on an agreement of purchase and sale is $565,000, then I simply need to divide $565,000 by 1.13. I quickly discovered that the tax on that is $65,000 and thus the net price of the condo is $500,000. But actually a builder does something different because the builder, those tricky little butters, understand something, which is supply demand. The lower they make their price, the more demand there is for the product. And the builders have discovered a very sneaky way of actually lowering their price. They say on a product that has five hundred, that is $565,000, they say, hey, we'll sell you this $565,000 product for $541,000. Why? Because we know that you're going to qualify for a builder rebate from the government. The government provides a, a rebate of $24,000 above $450,000 for every new construction in the province. And they say, because we know that you're going to get this $24,000, and assuming you do, we will sell this to you for $541,000. Why? Because when you add your $541,000 and the builder's $24,000, that will bring my price to 565, which is how much I actually want to make for this condo. And so, yes, if you take a look at 541 and divide that by 1.13, you do not get the true net price of the condo. In order to get the net price of the condo, you need to actually understand that there's this thing called the HST rebate. And you have to add the HST rebate of 24,000 to the 541 in order to properly divide by 1.13. All of this is to say that the HST rebate and qualifying for the HST rebate is the reason you are getting your price of $541,000. And if you didn't get that, the builder would still want to make its $565. And because there's no government that is providing that rebate, it is now on you to pay the $565 as opposed to the $541. If we were to just remove ourselves and just to make this a bit clearer, because I kind of feel I kind of went into the weeds there. Let's just think about this for a minute. Your purchase price is predicated upon the government getting a rebate of 24,000 and you paying the amount that you've promised to pay. And when you assign your agreement, the assignee, the buyer, really wants to make sure that that state of affairs remains. Because if the builder demands the HST rebate from the assignee, then the entire transaction will require the assignee to provide an additional $24,000 that they did not expect to pay in the first place. Because they expect that the purchase price of this unit is 541, not 565, which they are now being expected to pay. Amy has just asked, so at closing, will HST less the 24,000 rebate still be due if you buy a 1 million unit? Um, so at closing, if you are buying a $1 million unit, you have to pay $1 million and the government pays $24,000 in the normal course. So the builder is making $1,024,000 and you're only paying $1 million, Amy, under that scenario. Does that make sense? Okay. Why am I going into this? I'm going into this because on an assignment, it is very important that we preserve the assignee's ability to claim the HST rebate. This is how much the rebate is for. I don't really want to go into it. That's going to be, that's going to be a bit confusing. If an assignment is done after the interim closing, so is, are we all clear on what an interim closing is? It's an occupancy closing. It's the time in which you have possession of the premise, but you don't have ownership. It's a period of rent, interim rent. And I think all of you are familiar with what this is. You're all realtors, you're all in this space. So if an assignment is done after interim closing, it's critical that you inform your purchaser, your assignee, that the assignment, the HST rebate will be denied. 
So using our example back here for a minute, I don't know why I use separate numbers, but let's just use it. So remember how the original purchase price was $470,000? Well, now, because this was assigned after interim occupancy, the builder will deny the rebate. So someone want to throw out how much will you have to pay the builder for the actual finished product? It's not 470, is it? It's 470 plus plus $24,000. So the amount that is now payable to the builder by the assignee is 494, not 470. And as a result, now don't get me wrong, don't worry, the assignee can still claim that money back from the government. But what the builder is saying is the builder is saying, I don't know who's lived there. The rule is that as you can still qualify as long as no one has occupied the premise we as builders don't have the ability to figure out if the assignor has at any time occupied the premise. So we are going to deny the HST rebate to you entirely. And you can go claim it back and prove to the builder that you qualify for it. And because of that, it is critical that this line here be added to every agreement where you are acting for the assignee. The assignee requires the assignor to include and sign to this. It says the assignor acknowledges that it has not caused anyone to occupy the property and will not cause anyone to occupy the property prior to the assignment completion. At any time, the assignee can request a signed statutory declaration from the assignor stating that they have not caused anyone to reside at the property and this clause shall survive and not merge on the closing of this transaction. Why do we have that? We have that because if you have that clause as part of your Schedule A, then you, the, your lawyer, the assignee's lawyer, the buyer's lawyer can demand of the assignor's lawyer, the seller's lawyer, that they provide a sworn statement stating that no one has occupied the property. And thus, if on final closing with the builder, your assignee is charged the $24,000, you will have the proof required to obtain that $24,000 back from the CRA and the rebate will be denied if an assignment takes place prior to, sorry, post occupancy. If an assignment takes place prior to occupancy, you don't have any worries. The assignment will be granted to, the HST rebate will be granted to, there will be no issue. If the assignment takes place after interim occupancy, it will be denied and you will have to claim it back having paid it, similar to what the HST rental rebate is. That's a lot. I'm sorry. It's quite confusing. We're recording this. You can go back and see it. Does that all make Did that make sense? Question. It's a bit intimidating. That's a, that's a lot. Okay. So let's talk then about the, so, so one of the things I wanted to talk about was how the HST rebate works. We now understand what the HST rebate is. We understand that it will be denied if an assignment is placed after interim close. And we understand that you need to have this wonderful provision here um, in order to ensure that you can claim it back so that it's a cash flow hit. Yes, you have to pay the $24,000, but you'll get it back. But there are other tax implications The first one I want to talk about is this lovely line here. Everyone gets confused with this here, HST. See that HST? I tell you is at thumb, if you do not know, always write included in, always write included in. HST, if the sale of this property is in HST, then such tax shall be included in. Now, let me explain what the HST it is referring to is. Because we've now talked about two different types of HST, and this is referring to a third. We've talked about the HST that is included in the purchase price. Remember I said it's $565,000 65, of $565,000. So that's the HST that's included in the purchase price. We've talked about that. We've talked about another type of HST. It's not really HST, it's called the HST rebate. I wish to God that the government would possibly um, name it something else. They don't. Uh, they call it the HST rebate. I wish they'd call it anything so that it doesn't have the word HST in it. They should just call it the new build rebate. But anyways, it's called the HST rebate. And 
that HST rebate is for $24,000. And we've talked about the tax implications and maybe having to pay it and claim it back if it's happened after interim occupancy. But there is another HST matter that we need to be concerned with on assignments, and it is this. It is the case that, it is the case, and this, these are using the numbers that we had just talked about before, right, from the Schedule B. So I'm, I'm bringing it from the Schedule B over here. It is the case that in the event, in the event that the CRA thinks that at the time you purchased your original agreement of purchase and sale as the assignor, you had the intention of assigning the agreement, they will term you what is called the developer. And as the developer, we are aware under this scenario that with the $470,000, that per original purchase price already includes HST. The government's already got its due. But there is more money that is being paid. And because you're now a developer, because you had the intention of actually selling this prior to close at the time of the agreement was signed, that's their criteria. And we'll talk about how to challenge that. There is a further $130,000 profit. And that does not include HST at all. If the government turns to you and says, you, had the, you bought this with the intention of assigning, you bought this with the intention of selling to a new party, you are the developer, well, the assignor will then be responsible for HST on the difference on this $130,000. And just for giggles, because the HST, because the CRA is all about the giggles, they also say, hey, and you know that $80,000 that you're returning? This makes no logical sense, but this is the rule. You also have to pay HST on that. So you have to pay $130,000 on the profit plus the $80,000 times 13%. So you, because we've determined that you're a developer, because we determined you, the assignors, the sellers of this transaction, had at the time you signed the agreement, the intention of assigning, we are charging you income tax, sorry, we are charging you HST on the amount that we did not originally charge on the 470, plus the return of deposits for some reason that no one understands. And in addition, the assignor has to pay if you are determined to be a developer, income tax, not capital gains. Why income tax? Because this was done in the purpose of business in the CRA's eyes. You bought this unit specifically to assign it, specifically to do business. You didn't buy it for other purpose and then you're selling it and thus the capital aspect of it is being taxed. No, you bought this unit specifically to sell this unit and therefore so you need to pay 100% of the profit is included in your income. So the 130 is included in your income and you have to pay HST because we collect HST on these things. That is the worst case scenario. Best case scenario for an assignment is that you pay tax capital gains on the $130,000 that you make. So the real question is, well, hold on a second. In what instance does the bill of CRA turn into us and say, hey, you had the intention to assign? Well, this is what you need to ask your accountant for. And more importantly, this is what you need to warn your clients about. You need to say, listen, in most instances, this is your first assignment ever. In most instances, the CRA lets you get away with it. To my mind, I've never heard of anyone not getting away with it the first time. And thus you will face capital gains on, your, on the sale. That's what you're gonna face. But you should be aware that as the assignor, there is the possibility, there's the possibility, especially if this is your second, third assignment, fourth assignment, so it's clear that you're doing this as a business, that instead of paying capital gains, you're gonna pay income tax because you had the intention of making income from this. And what's more, if that happens, the government won't only levy income tax, but they'll also say, where's my HST from this? Because you're the acting as the developer here, which means you have to pay HST on the profit plus the return of deposit. So then what does this clause mean? This clause, which is not coming up for reasons that I don't understand, there we go. What does this clause mean? Section six. This is saying that if the CRA comes down and says to you, hey, assignor, 
we think you at the time you entered into your agreement of purchase and sale had the intention to assign. And thus we are levying capital income tax on you, but we're also levying HST. If that HST is payable, then the assignor needs to pay the 27,300, not the assignee. Now it only makes sense that this would be included in the purchase price because how the heck would the assignee possibly know if the assignor was going to be assessed by the CRA as the developer? There's no way. So it should always be included. Yes, Chris, the HST rebate clause, I can post it as part of this um, video session when we put it up. Um, so those are the tax implications. And that is what the HST of the yes, of the agreement this is the means. Um, and I hope that that is clear. I hope that everyone understands that aspect. I'd also point out that the assignee needs to pay land transfer tax on the assignment price on this 600, not the original price, 470. So those are the taxes that are involved generally in an assignment. Now it is now 1050. We've covered a lot of ground and I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, and uh, feel free, you can either ask your question or you can, um, or you can uh, type it and I'm happy to answer. Um, I know there was a lot of ground here and it was quite complex for a lot of people, um, but this will be posted again. And of course we are all available to, all the lawyers and forum are available to assist you with this. Please take your assignment agreements and ensure that they are pre-cleared with your lawyers before you engage them. You will find that they will be incredibly helpful in helping you properly structure these agreements. So what questions do we have? The example surrounding assignments with the builder is the original seller. Anything to be cautious about when it's a homeowner seller? No, no. Um, if it's a homeowner seller, um, so you're talking about like a resale, Karen, uh, on a resale, you don't even need the original seller's consent. Uh, as I talked about at the very first bit, if it's just a resale, no, you don't need anything. And there's no HST on a resale at all. So you really don't have any implications from a tax perspective either. Uh, Deepesh, if you want my contact details, they're right here. Um, but I mean, I'm available through the forum and please don't think I'm the only one who knows assignments guys. There are a lot of really good lawyers who know assignments on the forum. Um, they're all available to help you out. This isn't about soliciting just business for me. This is about generally helping our group. And there are a lot of lawyers who contribute and know this stuff backwards and forwards. Um, anything else guys? Nope. Oh, how does it work for FinTrack on a resale? The property is assigned before close. Um, Beverly, that's a good question. I'd have to look it up. I don't know offhand. Um, and so I don't want to give you an answer. I assume it works the exact same way as, as our normal agreements. Um, I've never really come into any other issue, but I've never really dealt with that. Um, no one's really ever asked me that question. So with your permission, I'm going to think on that question. Maybe we can take that offline. Um, where can you access the recording? All of our recordings are posted several hours later on in the forum. How can we access the slides? I, I don't usually post the slides, but uh, again, the recording with the slides will be up so you can watch it as to your heart's content. So if a person is buying multiple units at once, it's clear that the person will be deemed a developer when selling these as an assignment. No, if you buy say two units um, and you assign one, uh, you may be able to say to the CRA, as one of my clients did, look, I bought one for my kids. I bought one for me. My kid got into medical school in New York. This is a true story. Um, so we're, we're assigning and the CRA bought that. Um, we showed them the application, the medical acceptance letter to NYU and boom, done. Um, no, not necessarily, but it will be in the eye of the beholder. Um, so if you buy multiple units at once, that will certainly be a strike against you. And it will be harder to show the CRA that you are not acting as the developer. It's a challenge. Really what you want to do from a tax perspective is you want to just say, listen, I understand that there are tax implications before we sign on this, please make sure you speak to your accountant. Just pass the buck. 
Is there a time frame the CRA wouldn't deem the seller a non-developer if you sell multiple units? No, there is not. The CRA is a complicated beast. They do not like assignments. They are trying to crack down. They are getting harder and harder and harder on people. They are accessing more and more builder information through audits. Um, so no, there is no firm good rule that protects you. Uh, genuinely, it is if they think that they can make your life hell and get more money, they will do it. Um, usually the only people I know who are really relatively safe are those people who own one unit in their life and are signing it and then that's it. So uh, those are the only people I don't see who are regularly harassed. Are wholesalers doing, just doing assignments? Uh, yes, they are. But if you're talking about wholesalers um, from a new build perspective, if you're talking about wholesalers from a resale perspective, you know, doing assignments, but there's no tax implication on resale property. So no issue, no, no issue. How can we challenge intention? Um, well, you have to go to a tax lawyer and there are many good tax lawyers on our session. Um, I know Peter Aprile is someone who out from counter tax deals with this stuff, type of stuff regularly. And there's a bunch of others uh, on our forum who uh, strongly suggest you speak to. I'm not a tax lawyer. I'm not gonna try to tell you how to fight the CRA. That is for a different session on a different group um, with different people. Is it necessary for the assignee to find out before executing the assignment that the assignor purchased with the intention of buyer or developer? If yes, why an implication? No, it is not. Because the assignee is going to write HST is included in the purchase price. And thus, if the assignor purchased with the intention of being a developer, it's just the, the HST is gonna be payable by the assignor out of the profits. It has nothing to do with the assignee. That's the reason the assignee must ensure that in section six, HST is always included in. Make sense? Okay, any other questions? These are all good ones. We only have two more minutes. Excellent webinar, thank you so much. I agree, good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we are going to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop it there. Um, I'm going to tell you that we are concluding our tax sessions. Uh, we have um, foreign resident tax on tap next because last week or two weeks ago when we did our last session, uh, we divided out the basics of taxation for real estate agents uh, into two sessions. We did four, we did domestic, and next we're gonna do foreign, which is the NRST, and the section 116 will be a somewhat shortened webinar, probably a half an hour, uh, but I think we're gonna do it next week. I just wanna thank everyone for attending. Uh, you guys are awesome, you make our group what it is. Uh, keep going, let's, let's keep growing. Please invite your friends, and this will be posted in several hours. Thank you very much, take care, and have a great day, everyone.